This is Twiss. This Week in Science, episode number 728, recorded on Wednesday, July 3rd, 2019. Treating OCD. Hey there, this is Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we will fill your head with HIV, OCD, and mold. But for Twiss is supported by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The 4th of July, Independence Day, the day we celebrate as a nation with great pride and a plethora of pyrotechnics in memory of the illegal immigrants who, despite the odds, declared land stolen from a native population by the British Empire to be theirs instead. Yes, our founding immigrant fathers and mothers had no right to the land by law. And by defying a tyrannical monarch, they were, by definition, illegal trespassers in their own homes. They should have been deported back to the many, 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 many nations that they had fled in search of freedom. But instead, they stood tall, spoke half-truths to power, and declared America to be a nation of free people, except for the Negro and, of course, not extending all rights to women. To be fair... These were newcomers to America. Sometimes immigrants need time to adjust to a new society. First settlers could barely feed themselves, needed the assistance of the native population to survive. And the founding immigrants brought with them more than a few cultural hangups that needed to be worked out over a few hundred years of assimilation. It would be 144 years between 1776 and 1920 when women first got the right to vote. What? what? Right? Whereas in most Native Nation uh, American cultures, women had either equal or in some cases were the only voice on internal tribe issues, such as choosing who would be the chief, whose duties usually lied outside of actual core tribe institutional uh, matters. So as we celebrate this 4th of July, let us not forget that this is a nation of immigrants and that Independence Day is a day of declaring yourself independent from a foreign nation and finding a home instead here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. And, Blair. and a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again. Oh, there's so much science. Yes, and we're on the eve of a holiday as we record this episode. So everybody get ready to get your U.S. Independence potty hats on. But that's not what our show's about at all. <laughs> at all we're talking about science not yeah. politics i have stories about cutting out the hiv i've got another story about mold on the space station and uh -oh. we have an interview tonight with dr suzanne amari she's going to be speaking with us about her research into ocd but nice. before we get there justin what did you bring to the show uh what have i got i've got uh petri dish hamburgers anyone uh, oh, I do have maybe a little <laughs> bit of politics. FDA slackers and the funding that is making them slackers. And robots predicting the future by doing your homework. If I were still a student, man. All right. The future is bright for those who are young. Okay, Blair, what's in the yes. animal corner? I brought some bats. I brought some unusual crocodiles and some turtles that don't need any oxygen. Huh? What? None? Never? Well, you'll see. Hypoxic, <laughs> anoxic, turtles? I don't get it. I'm yeah. They're more. they're a hero in a half shell, one would say. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. As we move into the show, I want to remind <laughs> everyone that if you are not yet subscribed to this podcast, why aren't you? Because you get more punny things like that out of Blair. <laughs> <sighs> Shake a stick at 
Yes, we are everywhere you can find podcasts, iTunes, Google, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, Radio, TuneIn, all the places. You can also just find us at twist.org. We are also on YouTube and Facebook. All right, now it is time for our interview. I would love to welcome to the show our guest, Dr. Suzanne Amari. She is an associate professor of psychiatry by the university at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She has an MD and a PhD, doctor, 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 <laughs> from Stanford University, and she completed her postdoctoral work at Columbia University. She studies the neural mechanisms underlying obsessive compulsive disorder and other disorders of the brain. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. I actually feel so at home now that I know you guys like puns as much as I do. Yes. <laughs> All that nervousness, it just goes away. Oh, my, my punny family. There we are. <laughs> if, yeah, if, it, if, if it's possible and it fits in later, there's one I'd like to immortalize, you know, to because basically I have a graduate student who is trying to get out of the lab as fast as possible to avoid my puns. And (laughs) (laughs) this is is the new strategy for researchers, right? I'm going to just pun my graduate students into (laughs) their thesis. (laughs) (laughs) Like, get out of here. Otherwise I'll do another one. (laughs) Oh my God. That's amazing. Okay. I, okay, first question right off the bat, obsessive compulsive di- disorder, OCD, I, I think everybody has a sense of what they think it is. Yep. We, you know, there is the common phrase, oh, I was so OCD about yeah. that. It's yeah. like Which, the word literally not quite being used properly, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I would love, I would love your help. Would you please <laughs> tell us what obsessive compulsive yeah. disorder is and also why we really shouldn't be saying that, oh, you know, putting it lightly in our conversation, really. I oh, thank you so much for starting that way because it is one of the things. So, if if you don't, if anyone out there listening doesn't remember anything else about this night, just try to think about taking that phrase out of your vocabulary, take it out of your lexicon. The I'm so OCD. I do X Y Z because if you are saying that you probably do not have OCD. <laughs> you know, it, it's possible. It's possible. But most people who have OCD aren't going around saying, you know, I'm so OCD that it took me eight hours to get here in the morning. And I had to wake up at 2 a.m. to do all my rituals. And I was late two hours for work because I had to do all this stuff. So wow. so it's really it, just first and foremost, it, it had And I think it's really great that we're starting that way, because I think part of the problem has been that the media in general has tended to portray it as kind of a funny quirk, uh, odd behaviors, things that actually can make you perform better in life, right? It's like this idea that having OCD is actually a good thing because it means you're meticulous. It means that you are really attentive to detail. And it means that, you know, you're going to get the job done and do it better than another person would do. And, you know, people with OCD can be extremely high functioning. They can be incredibly intelligent. They can do really fantastic things in life, but it's not because of their OCD. Their OCD gets in the way of them doing even more than they could do otherwise, right? So what people are typically talking about when they say, oh, I'm so OCD, it's things like I need to have things ordered in a particular way. I need, you know, the, my refrigerator to be organized in this way. I need to load the dishwasher this particular way. I Mm -hmm. I, basically, I need to have control over my space. And Mm -hmm. there certainly is some overlap with those kinds of things with OCD proper, but what that tends to fall into the category of is something we call obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is kind of an entirely, it, it's a different thing that has mm-hmm. a lot of comorbidity, but it's probably got different circuits in the brain. And mm-hmm. there's a really, really clear distinction between them. And that is someone who has OC, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, or someone who doesn't even have that, but just likes things done their way, right? Like, you know, all of us like to have That's me. <laughs> so, you know, and in like, yeah have your space organized, have your things neat and clean, um, is that that's actually something you want to do. It's something that makes you happy. It's something that you think is good. 
Um, and it's something that you think the other people are wrong in that you're right and you're doing it the right way. Right. Um, and again, the most important thing is it's not impairing your life. It's not yeah. impairing your ability to actually have a job, to have friends, to have a family, to take care of all the things that you need to do in your daily life. OCD, on the other hand, is we're lucky in a way that the the diagnostic criteria, unlike some things in psychiatry, they're pretty clear cut. So it's having obsessions and compulsions, which is not surprising because it's called OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And an obsession is a recurrent intrusive thought, an impulse or an image that pops into your brain. And then a compulsion is something that you do in order to neutralize that thought, image, or impulse, or get the anxiety associated with that thought out of your brain. Right? And so that anxiety part, that, um, that, that link between that obsession actually causing this intense, overwhelming fear and anxiety or distress, and then the compulsion helping to kind of get rid of that anxiety. That's a really key, we think actually in, in the research that we're doing, we think that's a really key hallmark in this particular illness. And we think understanding those links, understanding those links between obsessions, compulsions, and anxiety might help us to figure out how to break this cycle for people. And so and, yeah. we're t we'll be talking about it from kind of the behavioral standpoint and also the brain standpoint of, yeah. okay, so you've got the obsessions and the compulsions. So behaviorally, you focus on something and then you have to do a behavior to free yourself of the anxiety, yeah. but then it can be recurrent. And so it, yeah. it happens in a cycle that happens over and over again. What yeah. do we know if there's, we haven't gotten to the brain part yet, but do we mm -hmm. know if there's a difference between you know, that recurrent obsession compulsion loop that loops on itself over and over and say, you know, somebody who goes, oh, did I turn off the oven? Mm -hmm. And you have to go back and turn off the oven or go yeah. check, even though you think to yourself, I must have turned it off, but you have to go back and check. Like, yeah. is there, what's the link? Uh, it's a great question. It's, um, and, and it's kind of a key question, right? Because we the, so the answer is we don't know what the relationship is between that what I would call this continuum this spectrum okay. right? because if you think about you know the kind of random intrusive thoughts that pop into one's brain we all have these so we actually all have intrusive thoughts you know it, it's an, an example I gave a lot when I used to live in New York which would you know New Yorkers would immediately understand but I think many of the general population would too is that idea of you know you're on the subway platform ah yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm already, you like, started oh already. <laughs> this is me at the, su at the subway it's the whatever wallet was I was pressed back against it <laughs> until the train came to a stop this is I had this over, you haven't even said what it is, but it's this <laughs> overwhelming fear that when the train came, I would somehow be on the tracks. Yes. you. So you nailed it. This is exactly what I was going to say, right? So you have had that thought. You had that intrusive thought mm -hmm. that popped into your head. This is awesome. Did you did you read my mind? I know. <laughs> no, no, but Blair, Blair will Blair, Blair will um, totally uh, uh, vouch for me. Yes. This was this, I would literally have to like <laughs> press myself against the back wall of the station. And I was there right at the yellow line, going, "Oh my god!" Yeah, with her hair. When when the train came, her hair's like whipping, whipping, bouncing braids, and I'm like, "Duh." I'm terrified. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like 10, so, away. so it's Dang. that thought, right? And so like half the people are like, oh, yeah, I totally get that. I'm afraid I'm going to jump on the platform. Half the people are like, of course, I've never had that thought. You can take it one step further. And then half of the people, I mean, this is, this is a non-scientific poll I've taken, but half the yeah. people have also had the random thought. They see someone on that yellow line. They see Blair out there and they're like, oh, what if I pushed her onto the tracks? You know, yeah. and of course you have no desire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Blair. <laughs> and you have no desire to do that you Wait. have you're not going to do it there's no chance that you're going to do it but the calculation of just how much force it would take <laughs> it runs fast 
the time. No. Yeah. <laughs> but part of well, that is just being a human with a brain, right? Well, so, so these are, this is random information from the environment. You're bringing this in all the time. You're doing random calculations. These random thoughts pop in. And most of this kind of flotsam and jetsam, you know, we're just like, huh, weird thought. And you just let it go. You're like, oh, that was funny. And then you talk about it, you know, over beers or whatever. But the problem is with someone with a, and, and so that that's kind of the point, right? Is that everyone has these thoughts, these thoughts that are random, that are what we would call ego dystonic. You would not want to do them. You would not hope to do them. Yet the thought pops into your head. But for most of us, they float in, they float out, and we move on with our day. For someone with OCD, that thought can essentially, essentially get trapped, right? So it's like they have the thought, that thought then sticks in their head. They're like, wait, why did I have that thought? Mm-hmm. What, what? Maybe I had that thought because I do want to jump onto the tracks. Maybe I had that thought because I do want to push that person in the tracks. Oh, my goodness. That makes me feel like I'm a horrible person, that raises huge levels of distress, huge levels of anxiety. And then, you know, the idea of, okay, how can I get rid of that anxiety? And again, it isn't necessary. There's not necessarily a logic between the thought and then what needs to get done to, to kind of neutralize the anxiety. In some cases there is, in some cases it would be, I am concerned about being contaminated with germs and therefore I'm going to wash my hands repeatedly over and over again in order to decrease the fear of contamination. But for someone with the, you know, the thought about the person jumping onto the tracks, maybe it would be that they have to you know, uh, you know t- touch the the subway platform 10 times and then they've neutralized that thought. They've gotten rid of the bad idea and then they can move on with their day. But maybe they have to touch the subway platform 10 times in a particular way until it feels right, until it's the right, you know, uh, the, the, in, until the signal that it's OK is kind of turned off. And for, you know, for some people, depending on how stressed they are, how anxious they are or how bad their OCD is, you know, that could be something where you'd only need to do two or three cycles and then you could actually get on the next train. Or that could be something where you need to do it for an hour and you're late for work or or that may be something where you can't even tolerate it and you have to go home for the day. And so that's the kind of thing, you know, that 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 we're talking about. And the interesting thing back to um, Kiki's original question about, um, you know, are those kinds of thoughts that pop into our brain, are they the same? But then the, you know, then the mechanisms that make them stick are different. That's, it's a crucial question. And it's one we would love to answer, but we don't have the answer to. (laughs) But what we do know is that if you take, it's, there was an interesting study that was done where um, they took people who didn't have any evidence of OCD, Um, you know, didn't have family members with OCD. They were just your quote unquote, you know, healthy controls. And they engaged them in this task where they were having to check a stove over and over again. You know, they, they were basically asked, it was a, it was not a real stove, but it was a simulated, it was like a picture of a stove, I believe. And they had to check over and over again to see if, in fact, the stove was turned off. They had then they were asked to recall later or not whether the stove was turned off. And, you know, and it was a stressful situation. It's in the lab. And basically, people even without OCD started to tend to engage in more and more checking behavior over and over again. So it's Mm. what that suggested in some ways is like. You know, and again, I do not think this is across the board, but I think there are kind of fundamental circuits that can potentially be primed more in some people than others to start to engage in these kinds of repetitive loops, right? It sounds a bit like, you know, that it's like training that your brain, there's the idea in neuroscience, you know, the, uh, the neurons that fire together, wire together, right? And so you're saying, okay, you, this happens, go check the stove. This happens, go check the stove. And it's like operant conditioning for people. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So so this is reminding me of when I was a zookeeper and I worked in the carnivore department, Uh, Um, I would leave at the end of the day and I would get to the very end of the space that I needed to exit. And I'd lock the door and I'd go, are all my locks locked? Yeah. Never 
in the two years that I was a keeper, did I leave a lock unlocked that was supposed to be locked. But there were many, many days where I would have to turn around, have mm-hmm. to go all the way back through all of my enclosures to make sure everything was locked. And I got to the point where I would take pictures. This is right after I got my very first smartphone. Mm-hmm. I would take pictures of all of the locks and they would have a date and time and location tag to them so that when I would have those anxious thoughts, I could open up my phone and I could scroll through and see all my locked locks. So so your phone became the compulsive behavior because what it sounds like though, is that it, I mean, these are, these are sounding like coping mechanisms. I'm, and if I'm hearing it right, the person who's tapping the platform 10 times wasn't getting on the train before Mm -hmm. was not going to get on the train and, and somehow invented a way of doing it. Now, uh, that, that sounds like something that needs to be cured, but on the other hand, then I'm thinking immediately to something like, uh, a, a bulimia or another, uh, something that causes, you know, there was this horrible story of this woman who drowned their child after hearing voices that told her to, you know, if, if it could be actually implemented to do a compulsive behavior when faced with something that's otherwise disruptive, more disruptive than perhaps the compulsive behavior. As a so it's an it's interesting. Like I actually hadn't thought of it from that perspective before. Of you know, it's like can there always be a worse thing right, that, you, <laughs> that you aren't doing? It's like is that compulsive behavior better than uh, you know? Yeah, again, like you know, uh, being addicted to heroin or being, you know, or being suicidal. But I think what I want to stress and probably didn't come through clearly enough yet is when someone has really, really severe OCD, and even when someone has like mild to moderate OCD, it can be extremely impairing, right? Um, so, you know, it, it can be so disabling that, um, that you might need neurosurgery. We were actually, we had, um, evaluated someone, you know, who hadn't been able to leave their house for three years. So this is when it's at its most severe, it's just as severe as someone who has, you know, very severe schizophrenia, very severe Mm -hmm. substance abuse, you know, any of those things. And I think part of the issue is most people at least don't don't realize uh, how severe it can be because most people haven't met someone with OCD that is that severe that has admitted to it, right? Yeah. It's We often call it the hidden illness because people are very often good at hiding the symptoms, at compensating for them, and kind of making do by by you know, I kind of alluded to this before by decreasing the amount of sleep they have by kind of limiting their choices in life yeah. by deciding that they could never have a partner by, you know, all of these kinds of things. So, so they're, they're aware of this. I mean, there's yeah, not, it, there's not a, yeah. like if you're caught in this loop, it's not that you have a memory loss or no. a short-term memory situation where you don't realize you've already done this, uh, this loop. Absolutely. It's, it's you realize this is the 16th time and now I have to get to the 20th yeah. or the Absolutely. Yeah. And and it's actually, and it's, it's interesting you bring up the memory thing because so, um, and it, and it gets to kind of Blair's story because, you know, I mean, honestly, that's, that's getting towards the verge, (laughs) you know, of, of that kind of experience, right. Which is not that surprising. Two to 3% of people have full fledged OCD in this country and many more have, you know, low level, again, it's a spectrum. There's low level symptoms that, you know, aren't going to be impairing, but that can get activated in times of stress. Or again, when the consequences of not doing it are really high, like in your case, if you hadn't, um, you know, if the locks had been unlocked, that would have, <laughs> that would have been on the news, right? Yeah. It, it's not something that- <laughs> Rhino escapes. Yeah. <laughs> the black news. Oh. But what's interesting, though, and and I really like that example in a way, because you could take those pictures on your phone, you could look at them, and that was enough reassurance to you that it was fine, you could move on. Mm -hmm. But someone with OCD with respect to that, that would not, that would likely not be reassuring enough to them, right? They would be like, but, and and this is, again, another key part, this is 
it defies logic. This is even when people are completely aware, like 100 percent or you know, 99.9% sure that the evidence is telling them that there is no problem. They still have to do the rituals. Mm -hmm. They still have to do these loops, even though logically they know there is no way that it's necessary. Um, and so, and so that's really the key thing is that they know that they're engaged in these loops that are, are, are not going to give them the outcome that they want or, or that's necessary, that they don't have to do this thing in order to keep, you know, to keep the bad thought, uh, to, to keep the bad outcome from happening, but they do it anyways. Mm -hmm. And they, and it's not that they want to do it. They are, they're compelled to do it. And, mm -hmm. um, and actually I think there, I thought I saw this, um, there was the image that popped up with yeah. the, the, the obsessive again. compulsive cycle. Cause it, yes. I like the example that I have there. I've used it, um, a few times, uh, or quite a, quite a bit in talks. Um, and so, you know, this is an example. A lot of people are familiar with contamination related OCD. So it's this idea that there's contaminations with, uh, you know, from the environment of various kinds. And so a classic example of this is seeing someone with a cut on their hand and saying, oh, you know, by seeing that cut, uh, I'm going to get HIV. So it immediately triggers this obsessive thought. I'm going to get HIV because I saw that. Now, this can be, you know, if you're, you know, standing 200 feet away from the person, if you know, like, logically that there's absolutely no way a virus can be transmitted that way, it can be even if you're pretty much 100% sure that that person doesn't have HIV. They can show you their test results from, you know, an alter, and it doesn't matter. That's still going to trigger what I label here as inappropriate fear. And it's inappropriate because it really defies logic. And that level of fear, it's really hard to convey unless you've known someone with this illness. It, it's really a life, it, it feels life-threatening to them. Right. So it's it's as if they will die if they don't do that. And it's like if I dropped a tiger into the room with you guys right now and it was going for you, you would you could feel that level of fear and distress. And when you have one of these uh, OCD triggers. And so then that leads to these ritualized behaviors. Again, I mean, this is actually up for debate and that gets into kind of the brain circuitry of it, you know, what drives what, but at least in one theory of the illness, it's this anxiety that's driving these compulsive behaviors. And then, and then the, one of the, the things that we're studying in the lab right now that we're really interested in this idea is that the kind of the problem, and I think, again, it's a hypothesis, but the idea is that one of the reasons why these cycles might get perpetuated, going back to the idea of firing together and wiring together, is even though the person doesn't want to do this, nothing about it is something that they actually want to do. But when they do that compulsive behavior, the problem is for many people, it can lead to relief. It can lead to anxiety relief, but it's mm -hmm. really, really temporary. It's really fleeting. And so it can make you feel momentarily better. And you can imagine if I took that tiger back out of the room from you guys, you would Ooh. so yeah. exactly, you feel so relieved. And that is such a that kind of removal of that horrible thing is really rewarding, actually. It's mm -hmm. it's such a relief that you feel safe again, right? And so that in and of itself can be really reinforcing, we think. And so part of what might kind of perpetuate these OCD cycles is that if you do get that, that kind of rush of relief, that that in and of itself might be a way of operant conditioning yeah. the brain to want to do this again and again and again, even though it get the relief, it's kind of that re the reward pathway. Exactly. The reward of, and, and that's, we call it negative reinforcement. It's yeah. like the, the removal of a bad thing is rewarding, right? If you take away a bad thing, then we're actually happy 
you know, and we're in, mm -hmm. in that relief is something that's actually not been studied as much. And so we've mm -hmm. we've actually got a, an ongoing study with one of my clinical collaborators here, Dr. Rebecca Price, and sh and we're actively recruiting. So if anyone in the <laughs> in the greater Pittsburgh, Ohio, uh, West Virginia area, um, we're looking for people to join our study to actually look at the circuits that might be underlying that process in people with OCD. So this is a wonderful segue into questions about the brain and how we know what we know about OCD circuitry to date. How have we looked at this and what do we know? Yeah, so we're, it's interesting. So in the field of OCD, we're actually pretty fortunate in that we know quite a bit at least about what circuits we think might be involved in OCD. And we certainly don't know all the players, but there's been a lot of really good neuroimaging work done over the years that's highlighted abnormalities in particular regions of the brain. So we have abnormalities in par portions of the prefrontal cortex, which is really important for things like decision making, deciding what actions you're going to do, assigning values to action. And in particular, uh, we have, as shown on the slide here, the orbitofrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex. So all of these um, these, these particular regions have been shown to be hyperactive, um, uh, both at baseline and when symptoms are provoked in people with OCD. Um, it always, it, yeah, if you get into the details, it also gets complicated because in some cases there can be decreased activity, but, uh, you know, in, in general, uh, you know, if you look at, at baseline, these are the kinds of things you see. Then you also see increased activity in parts of the brain, including the caudate, which is a part of the basal ganglia, which is important for against executing actions, executing the kinds of things, you know, movements and sequences of behavior, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also problems, uh, hyperactivity, I should say, in the thalamus. Um, and what we know that the, the cortex and the striatum and the thalamus all talk to each other in loops. And so you, you can have signals transmitted between cortex, striatum, thalamus, and back up to cortex. So this has led to lots of theories over the years in the field of OCD that OCD is you know, really a problem of abnormal communication within these kind of cortical striatal thalamocortical loops. Um, so, so we have good evidence for that from human studies. And then some of the work that we do in the lab is really geared towards trying to dissect those circuits and trying to see how these different regions of the brain are actually communicating during compulsive behaviors. Um, and yeah, and we can talk more about that. We can show the fireworks movie, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I was looking and back in 2013, you yeah. had, you were one of a couple of teams that had come up with kind of opposing experiments mm -hmm. on yeah. this circuitry in mice yeah. using uh, a technique that it involves light in the brain. Yes. And yeah, so I was wondering if you could kind of give us the background because that kind of, that study from 2013 kind of set the stage for understanding things that we've, that you've moved forward on. Yeah, so this was a study that was basically using something, as you said, using light to do activation in the brain. It's called optogenetics. Mm -hmm. um, and so what optogenetics allows us to do is take advantage of the discovery of light-activated ion channels from, actually, from unicellular green algae. And you can take these channels, you can put them into neurons in the brain, and essentially what they do is they act like sodium channels. Um, and so... A sodium channel in a neuronal membrane, if you open it up, it lets sodium in. If you close it, yeah, it, it lets sodium in, it lets potassium out. You generate an action potential, you get neurons firing in the brain. Now, if you put some of these channels into axons, you can essentially use light to turn these channels on and off, and you can effectively cause neurons to fire action potentials in real time. And so this was really exciting because it allowed us to gain real control 
over neuronal firing patterns in the brain. And we could start to test some of these hypotheses about how hyperactivity in the brain of these particular regions might actually be linked to behaviors that might be relevant to OCD. And so in the work that we did, we took normal mice and put this one of these molecules called chanorhodopsin into this connection between the orbital frontal cortex and the striatum, and then hyperactivated that to see if it would generate OCD-like behaviors. Now, that's a whole other question. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? You basically basically took the optogenetics and put the light in and said, go, neurons, fire more. Fire. (laughs) Can we make OCD happen if we add more firing? Exactly, exactly. And we found something really interesting, um, which was that if if you turned on those circuits, you essentially... um, if you turn them on, you didn't immediately see anything that looked like it might be relevant to OCD. But if you repeatedly stimulated the circuits over the course of multiple days, you saw a gradual evolution of an increase in grooming behavior in Mm -hmm. in these mice. And what was interesting, so the light had to be there for this to happen, but it actually, the, um, the, the abnormal grooming behavior wasn't happening when the light was on, It was happening when the light was off, which was suggesting that there was some kind of plasticity process like Mm -hmm. we were talking about before that was slowly building up gradually to lead to this change in in the behavior over time. And then we did, uh, we basically combined that optogenetics with electrophysiology. So being able to record in the brain at the same time as we were doing the stimulation and then saw, in fact, that, yes, when we were repeatedly stimulating We saw over the course of time, if you put another pulse of light into the brain, if you put a pulse of light into the brain, you got got more activity out over the course of time. So essentially, we were strengthening that connection between the orbital frontal cortex and the striatum at the same time. And the interesting thing is, so, um, you know, not only like was that showing you that you could get this progressive increase in the abnormal activity and and the abnormal grooming behavior, if we then didn't have the light on, you know, left them alone for a couple of weeks, came back two weeks later, you still saw that there was a persistent change in this behavior, even though it had decayed slowly over time. Um, So that was just showing us that if we, if we kind of broke this circuit by hyper stimulating it, we could actually lead to this manifestation of the abnormal behavior. And other work that we're doing is actually kind of taking that animal model that was used in the other paper you were referring to. Mm-hmm. The, it's, it's a transgenic mouse model. It's called the SAPF3 knockout mouse. Um, and, and that'll segue into some of the, the newer work we're doing in humans, uh, well, mm-hmm. human postmortem work. Um, And in the SAPAP3 knockout mice, what's interesting is that at baseline, they have a completely different brain. So in a way, yeah, what we were doing with the optogenetic stimulation was much more, you know, kind of taking a a normal brain and seeing if we could push it, which is, you know, done in an adult animal. And so potentially not as similar as what you would expect might be happening in OCD, which we know is an illness that has a huge genetic component to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what the, the other mouse model did was essentially, uh, it, was, it was a mouse that was made by knocking out this particular protein called SAPAP3. It's a postsynaptic density molecule. It's important for kind of holding, you know, holding synaptic shape together, especially so at- So that the neurons connect with each other. So, yeah, so that they're mm-hmm. effectively able to connect and communicate properly. Um, and if that gene is knocked out throughout the whole life of the animal, essentially the the the- animal develops this very compulsive grooming behavior. And, I, and, and it is truly compulsive in the real sense in that it does it despite there being negative consequences to this action. So it, it continues to groom despite it being painful and developing painful lesions. Um, it disrupts ability to sleep, to eat, to take care of pups, to mate, et cetera. And it'll continue to do that. Um, and so at baseline, the brain is very, very different. And and so then what we've been doing is taking those animals that have essentially grown up with this genetic change 
and using technologies, including optogenetics, including um, in vivo microscopy, where we can take these tiny little microscopes and put them into the brain of the mouse and um, see neurons actually flashing and firing and watching them communicate in real time as the animal is engaged in compulsive behavior. Um, and if we're lucky, we might Yes, yes, I was just going to grab <laughs> that. <laughs> because so yeah, so this this what you're what you're seeing here is basically a view down the lens of the microscope. So this is a, a tiny lens, 500 microns across, that we place into the striatum, this kind of action control center in the brain. And it, it each of those flashes of light that you're seeing is essentially one neuron firing and communicating with these other neurons. And this particular movie was taken when a mouse was engaged in this compulsive grooming behavior. And so what we're trying to do now is decode the patterns of activity that are occurring in the compulsively grooming mice versus the non-compulsively grooming mice and seeing what the, you know, if we can essentially figure out how the signal in this behavior that outwardly might look the same, might be different in the brain. Yeah, that's fascinating. The question of something that behaviorally looks the same, yeah, having a completely different neurological basis. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, and, and, and that it, it's interesting because it's like, you know, so so people. There's many different tasks that we can look at in people who have OCD, and see how they perform differently on these different tasks uh, from people who don't have OCD. And one of, example of a task like that that we're we're testing in the lab in animals, it's called reversal learning, and it's a pretty simple task. You know, you in in the way that we're doing it, the animal has to learn to press a lever to get a chocolate reward pellet. And then it has to learn to change the rule. It has to learn that actually it's the other lever that's going to give it the chocolate reward pellet. And the mice in general can learn that pretty well. And people with OCD can have problems with that activity. So mm -hmm. they can have problems in actually switching these tasks, uh, switching the rules of a particular mm -hmm. task. And um, which may or may not exactly be correlated with their symptoms, but it might be essentially a marker of the symptom. Might be a tell, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then the the thing that's interesting is when we look in these genetically changed mice, what we see is that they, in fact, half of them have normal reversal learning. They can do it completely the same as as the normal mice. Half of them do not. They completely fail. And then we can, so what we have is this spectrum of these mice being able to succeed or fail on this task. And we've, we've gotten some clues that we published relatively recently about what the brain might be doing to compensate in the case of the mice who can succeed on this task versus the mice who couldn't, even though they're genetically identical, they have the same genetic change. Hmm. And similarly, in people with OCD, if you have, you know, they might be able to perform the task well, but that's because their brain is actually acting in a different way than someone without OCD might have. So they have these potentially compensatory mechanisms that are being put in place in order to, to make those changes. The research that you have published recently that led to this interview has to do with uh, cadaver brains looking yeah. not at mice because as it, we talk about this over and over on this show is as interesting as mice are, they're not people. <laughs> and so how can we actually they learn are more? <laughs> Little mouse and, people. Yes. And eventually when the, when the mice do become sentient and take over the earth, they'll really appreciate all the hard work we did for them. Yeah, for them. <laughs> yes. But it, it is, they're not, not everything is evenly applicable or adequately applicable, applicable to human therapies and, and treatments. And so the, the looking at humans is more, is much better, but <laughs> humans are hard because you can't slice up living people brains. That is correct. Uh, so how did you go from fMRI to looking at molecular um, uh, profiles of deceased the brains of deceased individuals with OCD? 
Yeah, so this was actually something that started when I when I started my lab at the University of Pittsburgh. So um, Pitt has a really fantastic resource, and it's a human postmortem brain bank. It's part of this uh, national consortium of human postmortem brain banks. There's six in the country that are within this particular consortium, and it is an amazing resource um, because, you know, basically very, very generous people and their family members have decided to donate their brains for, for science and for, and, and honestly less, I mean, it is for science, but it's for human health. It's to try to actually uh, really advance our understanding of these diseases. Um, And, you know, and it's not at, at, at Pittsburgh, in particular, we have a really strong concentration and history of doing research in schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, et cetera. And, but when I moved here, I thought, you know, actually there's, at the time that I moved, there had been no postmortem studies that had been done in OCD. And again, it gets to this idea that, you know, it's an underrecognized illness. It's something that people don't think is that severe. And it's something that, again, goes under the radar in terms of people even reporting that they have it because of stigma that's associated with it. And so, you know, and, and the reason it's important to think about that, research, uh, that, that, that question is because I, I'd started by saying we know a lot about circuits that are involved in OCD from the imaging studies, but we know very, very little about the molecules and genes that are abnormal in OCD. Again, despite the fact that it, there's estimated between like a 40 and 60 percent genetic uh, genetic basis of the disease, probably closer to 40. But and that's in part because there have not there basically haven't been enough resources put into trying to identify the genetic causes. And I can I can get into, you know, I can get up on my soapbox about that. But <laughs> but basically, you know, essentially in order to get there, there now in a, in a relatively recent study, there were like 100 genes that were identified as being potentially important for schizophrenia in order to find those genes, they needed to examine on the order of 36,000 people with schizophrenia and 113,000 people without schizophrenia. In OCD, the similar genetic studies that we're trying to do to identify the genes at this stage, they've had um, uh, around like 2,500 people with OCD and uh, around 7,000 people without OCD. So and we so far have not found any genes, but it's likely because we're drastically underpowered to find it. Right. So I'm not a geneticist, right? So I'm <laughs> that is a problem that other people are trying to solve. But what I could do with the help of wonderful collaborators here is to look at our postmortem brain bank and see if there are actually any people who've donated their brains who had OCD. And so I had a really amazing graduate student, Jean-Pierre Tedosi, and amazing undergraduate student, Brittany Chamberlain, they combed the brain bank to try and find any cases that had OCD. We found eight. So wow. there, were, there were eight brains that we had to work with. Um, and we found eight really well-matched controls. And honestly, it was so few brains that we were not expecting to see much. But so we we looked, we, we didn't have money to do this study at the beginning. So we, we did a very kind of um, surface level examination initially, just take looking at genes that had been suggested to be potentially uh, relevant to OCD. And so we took those genes, we did PCR on them, qPCR to make it quantitative, and then looked at the amounts and the controls versus the people who had OCD. And we saw we we weren't because there was so few subjects we weren't expecting to see much we saw really striking changes um and they they were pretty unexpected which was what was exciting so we looked in regions of the brain that we know from imaging studies are likely to be involved we looked in orbital frontal cortex we looked in striatum mm-hmm. and what we saw when we looked at glutamate related genes which are the excitatory uh, like the the ways that excitatory uh, synapses talk to each other we saw a striking down regulation of uh, oh and now we're seeing the the kind of picture of the glutamate 
uh, the glutamate associated synapse. So what we saw were many of the proteins that are being shown here, uh, the genes that that encode them were actually being downregulated in the brain of people who had OCD compared to people who did not have it. And if we can show the graph, yeah, there's the graph. So, so essentially what, what this is showing you here is that we have, we've grouped the, the transcripts that were involved in synaptic, there's a little typo there, but it was like synaptic structure protein. So the, the, the transcripts that are really important in holding those synapses together, um, those are shown here on the left. And you can see in the orbital frontal cortex, that's those first two bars. You see a really significant downregulation there. In the striatum, there's also some evidence of downregulation, but it's not nearly as striking. And then again, if you look at the graph on the right, the receptor level and the transporter level in these glutamate synapses, again, you see this downregulation within the orbital frontal cortex. So what was really interesting was that that all everything we saw was downregulated, um, and this was quite surprising. And it's really kind of opened up new ideas to us about how things might be happening in the brain of of people with OCD that we wouldn't have come to without this amazing resource. Right. Well, and you think of, you know, you, 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 you think of the previous work and uh, kind of hyper exciting the orbitofrontal yeah. cortex and that circuitry with your, with, uh, with the light stimulation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You're hyper exciting it. And so you're thinking, yeah. okay, it's going to be hyper excitement and yeah. upregulation that yeah. will lead to this activity. And then molecularly, it's like, no, well, and, and that was what, and, 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 and that, and also it's like you have these decades of, of human imaging research showing you that it's increased activity in the brain, yeah. you know, in all of these regions. And then you see that, it, that these transcripts are in the opposite direction, but. But, but this is the but difference between fMRI and actual molecular like <laughs> level stuff, because fMRI, you're looking at, uh, at glucose up, uh, uptake and you're looking, you're not looking at the receptors themselves. You're looking at hundreds of neurons and their activity in small areas. And so it's this kind of amassed. Amassed data. net activity, right? Net activity well, of, hey, blood flow, oxygen, <laughs> glucose, yay, activity. But it's not what the activity is. Yeah, yeah. Well, but so it, it's funny because I actually just had this conversation with my grad student, Sean, who was the first author on this work today. Um, because we've been we ever since we got these data, we've been debating about what it actually would mean if it were translated into activity. Yeah. And so because like at the surface level, you know, it's like you look at all of these excitatory transcripts and you see, OK, they're all down. That must mean the brain activity is down. But actually, that's that's too uh, too broad of a stroke here, because what we have is we have all, so in some cases, for example, there's the protein that's actually the same one that's downregulated in that knockout mouse, the SAPAP3 knockout mouse. Um, we saw it downregulated too in our, in our, um, in the human postmortem brains. And if you look in these SAPAP knockout mice, so again, they have the downregulation, but we can get into their brains and we can like probe them and what you see is you see increased activity in their striatum, right? Mm -hmm. So even though they don't have that protein in their striatum, it's gone. And in theory, that should be leading to fewer, you know, le less excitation. You actually see an increase in excitability. And that gets to the point that these are complex networks that are all doing many different things. So while we have a downregulation of that particular transcript, that particular um uh, synapse associated protein. We also have down regulation of a particular glutamate transporter, which normally serves to soak up glutamate and kind of sequester it, not, not at mm -hmm. really super high levels. So not to the point where it actually does that much to synaptic transmission on a daily basis, but, you know, but 
that would tone down hyperactivity a little bit. So it's, or, or sorry, uh, other way, <laughs> that would that would actually increase the activity a little bit. So so there's all these complex, and you know, if you have down regulation of NMDA receptor subunits versus AMPA receptor subunits, and how much of one versus the other is actually going to yeah. change plasticity mechanism in a different in a particular way it can be hard to figure out how all of those different changes are going to translate into. Yeah. It's the different, it's the different levers because you've got the levers that say go and you've got the levers that say slow down and how much each of those levers is turned on is going to influence the amount of overall activity. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and again, I, I, I love the human postmortem, brain research, because again, it is the human brain. It is brains from people with reported symptoms that have been carefully described by, by clinicians. You know, we know what we're dealing with in terms of the symptoms that they have. This is not the same as an, as a mouse. Right. Um, and so it's, it's wonderful, amazing information that we can get that we can't get another way. Um, but it is a snapshot. And so that's, that's the kind of thing where you can think, okay, so yeah, maybe it is overall this idea that it's uh, a down regulation, uh, that that there's uh, this down regulatory process, which then I can dream up hypotheses about what that might mean that, yeah. okay, maybe the thalamus is having tons of input, and then the cortex is trying to, you know, turn the signal down. And that's why it's down regulating all of that. But again, that's based on the premise that, that we can translate these changes into the activity patterns that we actually understand that. But it could also be something like maybe, I mean, there's also evidence from human imaging studies of structural changes in people with OCD that they have um, uh, uh, they have less volume in the orbital frontal cortex. And so maybe this is the problem with synapse loss, right? And that, you know, that's- And that's different that altogether. Exactly. And we're actively testing that. And isn't that, but that can that also, I mean, can't structural changes come from like having had OCD for a very long time or something of this yeah. nature? So that that's an affect of the disease and not the. Yeah. And not the cause. Absolutely. And that's what's very difficult to tell in these kinds of studies, because we don't have very good longitudinal studies where you're tracking people at risk um, and, and then see whether they're developing it and see what's the cause and effect. And that's actually why I like to use animal models and humans in combination, because then you can try and go back and forth and take yeah. findings from the humans and put them into the animals and vice versa. Um, because, you know, that is, you know, really one of the challenges of working with human people suffering from illness is you, it is very difficult to test causality, but we are getting closer actually. And, and the, this is, you know, interesting work that's going on now where, you know, you can use things like transcranial magnetic stimulation to actually upregulate or downregulate particular circuits in the brain. And the precision isn't great yet, but it's getting better and better. And so it's not that, you know, and, and, you know, we, of course, are thinking about this as a therapeutic as opposed yeah. to, you know, um, and, but there's some really interesting studies going on right now, including some at University of Pittsburgh, again, by my colleague, Dr. Price, who, who's, who's looking at whether turning up or turning down orbital frontal cortex activity might actually help to help people with exposure therapy for OCD, things like that. So I guess my question is based on all of this information that we're getting about physiologically what's happening in the brain with OCD, but then also you have this whole side that we started talking about, about behaviorally what's happening. And, and so the behavior side of things, you can really attack with more counseling and, and therapy and stuff like that. And then there's the, the physiological stuff, which you could attack other ways, kind of hands-on. So when you're talking about treatment for OCD, does that mean it's like diet and exercise? It's like always <laughs> both, right? Actually, yes. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's funny with respect to treatment for OCD. The really interesting thing is that, so, you know, we have medications for OCD, um, and the first line therapy for OCD is serotonin reuptake, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and, and well, also uh, one called clomipramine, which is not selective. And those are the only first line monotherapy for OCD, but they're only effective um, in a proportion of people, like 
full remission is about 10 to 15%. Mm -hmm. And most people get kind of a partial response, like 40 to 50%, which can be super helpful, but it's not necessarily going to get you the whole way there. And then on the other hand, we have exposure therapy, um, which is a behavioral therapy approach, which when it's performed correctly and the patient is able to do it, which I say it that way because, again, in uh, the the kind of um, the um, uh, the the way it's done, the mechanism by which it works is you kind of step up through a hierarchy of people's obsessions and compulsions and say, okay, in this trigger situation, now you have to resist doing your compulsion. And it can be incredibly, as you can imagine, challenging for people to actually comply with that treatment. But if people do it, it's, it can be highly, highly effective. But so the combination therapy has been shown to be the best in the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So both are important, but it's also really important, you know, when we're thinking about dissecting the biological mechanisms underlying these, you know, abnormal repetitive behaviors in the lab, it's also really important to think about, okay, we want to dissect how treatments work when they work. And so we're doing work to look at, you know, when serotonin reuptake inhibitors work, how are they working in the brain? And we're also using a model that was generated by another lab, Dr. Greg Quirk's lab, where they, they're kind of like developing a way to look at uh, mechanisms underlying exposure therapy like things in animals. And so then we can think, okay, how, you know, we know that that's working for a good proportion of people. How might those mechanisms, you know, be, how can we figure out those mechanisms and potentially use that to facilitate treatment or to maintain gains for help people maintain the gains that they make when they do that kind of therapy? What are your next steps and how can people help? So many, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so many next steps. No, so, I mean, we're, so we're engaged in a lot of different work in the lab because we are kind of trying to bridge things in the animals and in the people. So on the animal side of things, we're really interested in exploring this intersection between negative reinforcement, anxiety, and compulsive behavior. Um, and also to, we're, we're exploring some potential regions of the brain um, that one is called, um, uh, it's, it's an analog to something we call the, the pre-supplementary motor cortex, but very involved in planning actions and planning what you do. And we have evidence from another paper we, we uh, recently published that this may be hyperactive in uh, an animal model. Um, and so essentially kind of diving into that area a little bit more and seeing what might be going on in the brain. Um, so those are the kinds of, you know, those are some of the things that we're excited about in the mice. On the human side, we are really diving in to the postmortem brain in, in a real way. We are really fortunate to get funding from some OCD organizations oh, in order great. to continue to work. And, um, and basically what we want to find out is, number one, if other regions that have been implicated in OCD, such as the thalamus, um, are, might have abnormal changes as well in trying to get information about particular molecules that might even be new druggable targets. So the thalamus, for example, is really good at firing rhythmically. That's one of the things mm -hmm. it does. And again, this is pure speculation. We have no idea what we're going to see. But... You can imagine, okay, so maybe if there is more likelihood that, that you know, the OCD thalamus is going to be firing synchronously, this might show up in a molecular signature. And now that we have the, um, the support to do this, we're able to look at things in a much more broad spectrum way as opposed to picking out genes that we think might be important. We can actually look across the, all the spectrum of the expressed RNAs but, and, and actually see what pops up. And then an important thing is, you know, so far we've just looked at gene expression. Proteins are really important <laughs> because, you yeah. know, the gene expression, how that translates into the protein, that's still unclear as well. And so, you know, another another thing that we're really interested in is actually looking into the proteins um, and and seeing if there are proteomic changes in the in 
the brains of people who had OCD versus uh, those who did not. Um, and then yeah, I and then and then to be able to see whether, like you said, a certain percentage is genetic and a certain percentage is not. Yeah. And so between individuals, what yeah. are the different cohorts of changes? Yeah, absolutely. potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the illness. And I think, yeah. you know, we're really interested in trying to figure out where that lies. That is fantastic. And uh, to the other part of the question, how can people help? You mentioned yes. earlier you have studies and you're recruiting subjects. And you yes. also mentioned the brain donation. And we yes. have a couple of images I can put up here to help yeah. people. So brain donation is not something most people think about on no. <laughs> any basis. But so I want to strongly encourage anyone out there who is uh, viewing um you know, really think about it and talk to other people and try and get them to think about it too. So, um, and it's something that I didn't really understand the logistics of at all until I was here at this institution. So the really simplest, most straightforward thing to do is go to braindonorproject.org. And that has all the information you need to know about how to how to think about doing this. Um, one thing that's really important to realize is if you've checked your organ donor card, that does not include your brain. What? Yeah. Why not? That's uh, it's a, it's like an the organ. most important organ. Well, <laughs> brain transplants are currently not yet <laughs> oh. on, okay, on the and so, and I, was, so I didn't, I didn't actually realize that uh, yeah. the organ, organ donation uh, checkbox was only for transplant. Like if somebody yeah. needed a thing right then. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's, and, it, and it's really um, essentially a thing. It's, it's difficult unless you've organized it ahead of time. It's difficult in those kinds of situations in which organ donation is typically at play to coordinate both a brain donation and donation of the rest of the organs at the same time. Because of course, for organ donation, it's really crucial to get those organs out as quickly as you can in order to transplant the freshest, most healthiest organ that you possibly can into the person who's receiving it. And, you know, and, but again, if there's advanced planning and you want to do both of these things, it is possible. It's just that the teams have to work together. So the people who are, who are getting the organs for, um, for a transplant, they don't have the expertise to remove the brain and preserve it in the way that needs to be done in order to get good, high quality brain tissue for the kinds of studies that we're doing. Um, so it's, yeah, so it's just important to have forethought in, in kind of deciding to make that, uh, make that decision. And mm -hmm. also for family members, you know, it can be, you know, it's it's a distressing time for many people mm -hmm. when this issue comes up of whether or not the you want, you know, your your loved one's brain to be taken for research like this. Um, and so if you want to do this, it's a really good idea to talk to your family about this and to to kind of get all the answers that they might want about it. And it's really important to realize that we need all kinds of brains. We need and, you know, brains across the spectrum, healthy brains, not healthy brains. And, you know, but without that really precious resource, we just can't do the work that that we're trying to do to identify these molecular molecular potential causes of things like OCD and other psychiatric illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like this is this is a need that. Yeah. Maybe some somebody needs to figure out a nonprofit. I don't know, but there's so many people out there. I'm one of them that says I want to donate my body to science. Yeah, what yep. that means actually can yep. be a million different things. You can end up in a body farm, which would be super cool. <laughs> you could give your I could give you my brain, which would be awesome. I could help train doctors, which would be amazing, yep. right? But there's all these kind of different menu options, and I don't even know how to go about saying I want this to go here and that to go there and just use me for whatever science deems fit. Like <laughs> there, there needs to be some sort of coordinated effort here because uh, chances are a body farm maybe doesn't need a brain in the body for some of it that they're doing, right? So you could get the brain and they could still go study maggots that live in tortos. So it would be totally, it could be a coordinated effort for science to get all the different parts from somebody that's passionate about it. Yep, use and, the whole body. 
<laughs> and, it, and it is only on shows like This Week in Science where you will sa- hear somebody extremely excited about the possibility of donating their body to a body farm. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so cool. <laughs> can we go, Kiki? Can we go on a field trip? I would love it. <laughs> but, but I did, yeah, but that is a good point also Flair. that uh, in order to make these donations, yeah. uh, it's best to do them while you're still living. Yes. yes. Uh, so to, because, like she was saying, we need to plan. You need to yeah. have conversations. Uh, and, you have to do it before you yeah. die. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. too late if you're like, okay, I'm done with my body. Now I will give it to, <laughs> oh, wait, it's too late. It's I can't do too it late. So. Exactly. And that's the thing, you know, at least the coordination is hard. And yeah, the woman who um, who started the, the organization, Brain Donor Project, um, it, it is totally nonprofit. It was like she actually had the experience of her her father passed away from, I believe it was frontotemporal dementia, and she wanted to donate his brain. Mm-hmm. He wanted to donate his brain, but she was having an incredibly difficult time figuring out how to make that happen. And mm-hmm. so her name is Tish Hevel. And so she took it upon herself to just start this project and try and coordinate efforts across the country and, and really make this happen. So, and it's, yeah, so it's a fantastic resource and I highly recommend it. And, and it's very useful to you and your research. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know it's very late where you are at this point <laughs> in time. You. <laughs> talk about OCD so much. Oh, Typically, so- people don't want me to talk about OCD this much. <laughs> no, we no, bring it. Great. This is what we yeah. want. This is fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, where can people find you online? You have a Twitter account. Your lab has a yeah. Twitter account. And also, um, if they're interested in finding out more about your studies, where can they go? Yeah. So we have um, a web page, w- dot edu i believe i will check <laughs> and i will get you the exact information for that but yes yeah amari lab at the university of pittsburgh okay amari lab at the university of pittsburgh and we will have links on our website so awesome. that you'll be able <laughs> yes yeah. so that people can find you but yes we will make that available once again thank you so much for joining us tonight it has just been wonderful thank you to- so much it's been great yeah, it's been awesome. Now I'm wondering if my compulsion, my fear of the subway <laughs> is because I'm afraid of jumping in, of pushing somebody or being pushed. I actually think it's that I would get so distracted that I'd be in the middle of a conversation and all of a sudden. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. All of the above. These are, these are the deep thoughts that will keep Justin up tonight. <laughs> All right. It is time for us to go to a break, everyone. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us for the first half of our show. We've got science news still to come in the second half. Stay tuned for more. Thank you for listening to This Week in Science. I am so glad that you chose to enjoy your day with us, to listen to us, to watch us. Thank you for bringing us into your lives. We hope that we are bringing you something valuable. If you do think that what we are doing here is valuable, maybe take a little moment to consider supporting what we do beyond just listening or viewing. We are completely listener funded at this point in time, and we would appreciate your support in helping keep This Week in Science going. You can head over to our website, twist.org. That's where we have all the good things that are twisty, and you can find information there, links, ways that you can actually support Twist. So the first one, if you're not subscribed, subscribe. Click that big orange subscribe button. It sends you to the three three big ones, Google Play, iTunes, or YouTube. And at those locations, you can subscribe. You can get your friends to subscribe. If you want other options, we are available other places. Just look for This Week in Science in your favorite podcast directory. If you want to support us financially, you know, buying our stuff is a real help. So you can click on that Zazzle store link. 
It'll take you to our store where we have all sorts of products, t-shirts and hats and pillows and phone covers and mouse pads. Some of them have the Twist logo. Others have bits of art that Blair has put together for Animal Corner calendars. A portion of the proceeds from these sales at the Zazzle store do go back to support This Week in Science. Back at twist.org, you can also click on the donate button. That uses the PayPal interface to be able to allow you to donate once or in a recurring fashion. Just fill out the details if you're into PayPal. Click the button and make it go. The other way you can donate is through Patreon. Patreon is like a crowdfunding website for creators. And you'll be able to click, after hitting that Patreon button, one more time, click the Become a Patron button. And that gives you a page with a bunch of choices. You can choose how much your support is going to be starting at $10 per month, which is, you know, we do two to, we, we do about four to five shows a month. And so that's about the cup of, co- a cup of coffee, a nice cup of coffee every week you know, $10 a month. That's it. You get charged, you hit select, enter your information. And it's once a month, $10. That's it. And you know that that $10 is going to support your science habit, not just that caffeine habit, right? Yes, we'll get you with the science. So if you are interested, really, if you feel that we are valuable, and you bring me that, that we bring you something valuable in what we do every week, consider clicking that Patreon link, that Zazzle link, or the subscribe link, and supporting what we do with your listening or with your patronage. We thank you for listening to Twist, for being a part of what we do already. We thank you for your support. We could not do this without you. Explain the things you've heard with more than intuition. A lot of reason shows the way you go. And, and we're back with more this week in science. We are back. Hey, and it's time for that part of the show that we love called This Week in What Has Science Done for Me? Lately. Lately. That's right. It's a very short one today. A bunch of people responded to a post over on Facebook. And one of those responses is from Jessica Ridulfo. She says, science has gotten me a job in a cytology lab, and I'm so excited to start. Yeah, glad you're excited. I hope it's an awesome experience. She says, also, the promise of a vaccine for Alzheimer's disease makes me giddy yes yeah so there's there is actual applicable science effect there science degree science learning science job there you go there's also the promise what will science do what is research now going to bring us and i'd say will it is it will. This is something that is going to happen. I mean, we can't say, oh, five or 10 years. You know, we don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but the research is moving that direction. And yeah, I see it. I see it. Yes. So, Jessica, thank you for your what science has done for you lately, because it's true. It's what, you know, it does for so many of us. If you have an idea of what science has done for you lately, this week, last week, today, send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or leave us a message on Facebook. Click that Facebook message button, boop, 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 send us a little note and we'll be able to read your story, your idea, your thought on the show. And we appreciate you keeping this part of the show going. We can't do this part of the show without you. All right, let's jump into the science. Are we ready for this? Mm-hmm. Okay, we are going to do this. Let's get this 30, 45 minutes for a whole half of the show. We can- yeah, we can do it. Yeah. Okay, researchers publishing in Nature Communications this week. Big study. Researchers from Temple University 
School, Lewis Katz School of Medicine and also University of Nebraska Medical Center have worked together. This is collaboration, two teams working on different things with relation to HIV. One team was working on antiretroviral therapy. And so if um, you if you're familiar with HIV, pay, people take the antiretroviral therapy drug cocktail to keep their virus in check so that they don't get sick. And these are drugs that they, if you have HIV, you pretty much have to take these drugs for the rest of your life. However, this group came up with a new kind of twist on art, art antiretroviral therapy. They call it laser art. Mm. Yes, long acting, slow, effective release antiretroviral therapy. Oh, it's not real lasers. <laughs> it's not real lasers. <laughs> oh, man. But what it, it's like a time release. It's these drugs that are there instead of going in and whoop, there's all the drug and they have their half-life and they wear off over time. These are long lasting and slow effective. So they're they're more of a time release kind of system. They stay in the system longer and so suppress the virus with and keep it within the cells so it's not replicating longer. So that was one part of the team that they've been working on this thing on their own. And then another team had been working on CRISPR-Cas9 going, maybe we can identify the HIV genes in the chromosomes and figure out how to use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit them out. And so then the teams came together and they're like, what if we did this? And they worked together over several years um, and they humanized mice, which means that they took mice and then they gave them T cells, which respond to, which, which are human T cells, basically. They respond to human viruses and um, human treatments. And so they're called humanized. They're not human mice, they're humanized <laughs> mice because of this particular T cell aspect of their immune system. These T cells are susceptible to HIV, human induced. Uh, the, the human uh, immunodeficiency virus. And so the two teams are like, all right, what we're going to do, we're going to try different confirmations. We're going to do this laser art and we're going to be like, hey, let's give them that and see what happens. It puts the HIV to sleep for a little while, but then it rebounds. And so they still have issues. And then they're like, well, what if we do a repeated laser art where we give it to them multiple times? And they wanted to do that. And then they were like, let's do that with the CRISPR-Cas9 so that we try to cut the HIV out while the virus is sleeping. One third of the mice that they treated over a series of experiments are completely cleared of the HIV virus. What? Yes. So in human experiments and human things, we've had two people in the entire world as a result of uh, of therapies like, uh, where they go in and they they switch they switch things around. Um, I'm not remembering the name of therapy, but two people in the world have basically had their HIV cleared out of their systems uh, because they had, I think it was they had bone marrow transplants where the T cells and things were replaced, had been had been switched up genetically. Um, this is a small mouse study, a third of the mice, not 100%. So there are still things they don't understand about when it is effective and when it is not. But a third, they find absolutely, they looked at all sorts of tissues in their bodies. They looked at their genes and they couldn't find the HIV. So I have a, my question about this would be, when jumping from a small mouse study to a human trial, obviously it's not there yet. No. But in a way, what would you have to lose? <laughs> and well, no, this is a legitimate question. I'm actually yeah. asking, like, what could possibly go wrong with a CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing trial where it has proven successful in mice? What can go wrong? So question number one is the CRISPR-Cas9, is it going to be accurate and efficient? There's the question of whether there will be off-target effects. In the mouse study, they found zero off-target effects. So we don't know if it'll act the same in the human genome, though. We don't know if it'll cut 
as accurately in the human genome for whatever reason. So, it, you know, you need to test it. Um, but they're not going to jump directly. The researchers are currently working on primate studies. Great. So they are doing these experiments in a more closely related organism to humans. There we go. Yeah. And in one where it, you know, these mice had to be given these T cells that are susceptible to HIV, right? In, uh, in primate studies, they have simian immunodeficiency virus. So it's a completely uh, self-contained system that is running kind of in parallel. It's similar to the human disease system. So it's the primate model could actually be a much more accurate model than what we're what they're looking at in the mice. So that hopefully a paper will be coming out in even by the end of the year. We don't know. We'll see. Amazing. Yeah. And the thing to remember too, when we're talking about these off target effects uh, is there's very few drugs. They call them side effects when you're talking about a drug. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah. What a good yeah. point. They still we're, have these off target effects and they're like, nope, sell them anyway. Just tell them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and when they, and you don't always know them all. Like, it, like you see the laundry list of potential side effects when you're seeing the disclaimer on a drug. It's not that you're necessarily going to get all of them. Right. It's that there's a lot of things that they saw in the trials and they don't know why. Uh, otherwise, they could potentially have eliminated them uh, from being off target effects. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if anything, this with these and it's hard to say it's hard. to. We're talking about no off target effects in a mouse who cannot tell you that they can no longer remember where they left their keys. Right. There's 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 yeah. problems that way as well. Um, right. So we don't. Yeah, we don't know if there are other side effects yes. from the treatment of from all of the tests that they did, and they did a lot. They didn't see any side effects. The mice still behaved like mice. Um, mm -hmm. The tissues still looked like normal tissues. Um, yeah. We'll see. We will see. But this is a very interesting, what they're calling it as a proof of concept. Yeah. And it's the it's a, a interesting starting point to see, you know, is this, you know, this is a, an interesting question. Can we, with, with diseases like this, where it's, uh, this is a virus that takes itself and puts itself in our genome. This isn't a question of messing with human genes. This is, can we use CRISPR-Cas9 and other, uh, other drugs and whatever we have to clean a disease, a virus, out of our genome? Can we cut it out? It's, kind of, it's an interesting question. I, I, yeah. yeah. We will see. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. uh, and then moving on from HIV, I have a very... Uh, a very short yet interesting story about probing atmospheres. NASA is wonderful at looking out into the universe. And uh, one of our uh, nearby-ish, 100 light years or so away, a star, a solar system called Gliese, we've talked about it before, has several exoplanets orbiting around this, uh, this star. One of the worlds in the Gliese system 3470B, to be exact, is kind of weird. It's like, wants to be Earth. It's got a rocky core, but it's kind of like, I want to be a gas giant also. And so it's not, it's like, I, I'm like, my mass is not earthy, but it's not as big as Neptune either. I'm kind of in this weird in-between space. and I don't know who I am. And so Hubble and Spitzer telescopes took a look at this exoplanet and delved into its atmosphere, which is one of the first times that we have ever really looked at an exoplanet atmosphere before, which is, a, you know, in itself a huge step. So this planet, is, it has a thin atmosphere and it is composed of mostly hydrogen and helium. So it's kind of like our sun, except it's a planet. Yeah. And so it sits very, it sits pretty close to its star 
And they think what happened is that it formed close to its star and that it grabbed onto the ring of dust and gas that was kind of clumping up as the Gliese system, 3470 system, was being put together. And it was maybe had enough gravity because of its rocky core to grab a bunch of the gas that was in this primordial disk. And it didn't lose all of it because it had enough gravity because it has this, because like I said, like Earth, it's kind of massive. It's massive enough to hold on to an atmosphere. And the gases are relatively light, but it didn't end up puffing up. It didn't grab all the gases because it wasn't quite big enough and it was close to the star. And the star itself was probably burning off some of those gases as it was grabbing onto the gases. And so it ended up with this thin atmosphere instead of turning into a hot Jupiter. It's kind of a meh Neptune. <laughs> or should I call it a meh tune? Meh. <laughs> yeah, definitely that one. <laughs> that one. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's still pretty small, but it has an atmosphere, which is very interesting. And it uh, gives us another look at a planet beyond our own solar system with an atmosphere to ask and even potentially answer more questions about how planets form, how some planets turn into gas giants and others just gain atmospheres. So we're looking beyond. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty neat. Nice. To Gliese and beyond. And then when James Webb Space Telescope ever gets out there, maybe in two years now. I don't know. It'll be able to look at it more closely. Yeah, wasn't it supposed to go out there pretty soon after we had that interview in Baltimore? And then Yeah. 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 Oh, well, we're waiting. We're we're waiting as patiently as we can. Always waiting. Yep. (sighs) Justin, I do not need a burger right now, but please tell me what I'm missing. Okay, so uh, this is the future of lab-made foods. And the potential downside uh, is that people won't buy them. So we talk a lot about this, and I've been convinced that meat is murder. Uh, Not necessarily to the animal. That's uh, survival of the top of the food chain. Uh, But it's really bad for the environment. The resources that we use are contributing massively to global warming. Uh, One of the reasons that people are afraid of a resistance to lab-designed food that wouldn't require the same resources is that it is not produced in the natural way. These people have probably never seen uh, the manufacturing (laughs) floor of a food processing plant Uh uh, to think that food is naturally uh, made or produced in any way. No, the breakfast sausage that you are frying up in the morning wasn't from a fat farm pig that farmer Olga picked because it had gotten plump enough for the breakfast feast, then lovingly hugged it to death. (laughs) Carbon choice meats under sanitary conditions. No, this is not how this takes place. It's in some dirty warehouse with lots of uh, blood from the cow that was there uh, 30 seconds before, or still on the ground, and another one is going down. This is, it's just brutal process and then it goes to a place and then it sits and it's cooled maybe at the right temperature. well but never all mind also what part of the chicken is the nugget from right <laughs> yeah. so you have Ooh. this whole question of the processing after that yes so in the near future though we may be able to either come up with a synthetic meat product that is manufactured by uh, microbes or a we may be able to mass produce in a similar method uh meat directly from animal cells a bioreactor uh, that would save the world from the negative effects of raising uh, cattle and poultry and pork uh, with the massive amounts of water and land and nitrogen resources and everything else that goes into it. Writing in Frontiers in Nutrition, researchers warned that the most common, uh, common media framing of cultured meat as a high-tech innovation, as a cutting-edge thing, may actually be the least least effective way to get people to accept it. Uh, Because, of course, if people don't buy into this, it will never happen. Don't you think, though, if you you marketed it as a meat alternative, 
like a vegetarian product, it might actually gain a lot of traction, like the Impossible Burger, right? That's gaining all this traction everywhere. The, the Impossible Burger is, a, but these would still be animal cells. Right, which is where it gets mm -hmm. weird because like bit. for I example, don't eat red meat, but because Why of the, do you not? the yeah. environmental impact. So if this is environmentally, but then there's just this whole ex existential issue of like, is it meat? I mean, technically, yes, chemically it's meat, but it didn't come from an animal. So, it's, uh, so and, I don't know, actually. And then I the animal cruelty, sure. the ideas, the animal cruelty ideas aren't there anymore because it's right. cells. It's yeah. meat. It's cells. It's lab grown cells. It's cell culture. It's similar to so many systems we already have in place where cells, bacteria, algae, other things are vat grown. Yeah. Um, it allows for a certain removal of that concern. And if it's a lot of stuff taking place in one place, maybe that would reduce the need for resources. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is know. basically you've uh, paraphrased the quote uh, from lead author Christopher Bryant, a University of Bath, who says cultured meat has the potential to reduce the ethical, and environmental, public health burdens associated with conventional livestock farming. Uh, and then uh, co-author Dr. Courtney Dillard of Portland State University uh, and Bryant assessed how framing the cultured meat as an innovation which benefits society, one, or a high tech development. Or as very similar to conventional meat, uh, affected the, the attitudes and behaviors, behavioral intentions of people who were being presented with this meal. So they did priming, basically. This is an, uh, an alternative. Uh, this is high tech. This is basically the same as what you've already been doing. Uh, they put this in front of 80, uh, 480 uh, people. 88% were meat eaters, so we had a 12% uh, vegetarian context there. And they found that those who uh, encountered cultured meat through the high-tech priming had significantly more negative attitudes towards the cons concept and were much less willing to consume it. High-tech framing group was least likely to consider cultured meat safe, healthier, environmentally friendly. They rated themselves on average 14% less likely to try cultured meat compared to the societal benefits or same as meat groups. So uh, what's kind of interesting about this, it's the 480 is, I think, a decent sample size. The, the idea that they, just the way that they presented the framing of it could yeah. drastically alter people's reactions. I'm, but I'm honestly not surprised at, because people hate the idea of GMOs, right? Even though pretty much all of the food that we eat is genetically modified. So right. that's a whole silly thing. But they're like, I don't want any Franken foods. And it's exactly. kind of the same, right? Exactly. But that's, well, that's the so whole it, thing. It, it's framing. And so they're testing yeah. framing message. Yeah. How can how can we talk about this with the public and have them react in a positive way? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the yeah, truth is... Just, it's mul there are multiple publics, and so mm -hmm. there are going to have to be multiple messages. <laughs> mm -hmm. but. Yeah, and that's the other thing is that this is not genetically modified cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, like so. Not. So if GMO is the concern. This isn't it's it, but it's, if it's associated with science and synthetic. Oh, bad! If it's like, oh, here's a way to keep from having to use resources and kill animals. That's you know, that's a great idea. So. Uh, Humans are really like not rational creatures. Ah, news flash. Right? Yeah, okay. news flash. From there, take me into your science, sci other science, investigative other science, report. Science, yeah, the other history. story. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, okay. Uh, so the best way not to worry about a thing is to not look at the details of the thing too closely. Or, or if that's still not enough, you could hire highly trained people to look at the details for you so you don't actually have to. Uh, and then you can just assume highly trained people have looked at this. They'll be fine. But what if the highly trained people who you assume are looking at the details actually aren't looking at them at all? Not a problem. As long as you don't know, you still don't have to worry. But of course, the reason you were worried and didn't want to think about the details too much is because they were so worrisome. And so the fact that you're not thinking about them isn't the point. The point is there's something to worry about. <laughs>
And and you can explicitly be ignorant about how little you know until you hear that I'm talking about the Food and Drug Administration and the fact that these highly trained people don't seem to be looking at the details of any food or drug regulation you assumed was involved in the thing that you were eating or the drug that you were taking at this point. No big deal. No big deal as long as you don't care how things are made or what goes into your body or what might potentially kill you. So this is, uh, you know, uh, FDA, Compliance and Enforcement uh, uh, for uh, looking over and monitoring how food is prepared, how drugs are manufactured, what is or is not safe for public consumption. And according to Charles Peeler, and this is uh, he's a contributing correspondent in the news department at Science, uh, they're down a third of their inv- of their warning. So their their FDA is the adult when it comes to supervision regulation of clinical trials, food safety, product recalls, medications, medical devices, and other things. They do warning letters. They flag violations, uh, saying, "Okay, this is a dangerous food. That's a dangerous medical device. You should pull this off the market. You should relook at this." We're you know. Warning, warning, warning. We have a problem. Those are down a third since the current administration has taken place, and they're actually down. uh, They're they're trending down from the first year to the second year. Uh, This is also, um, we're also looking at a a time when the USDA, uh, which also has similar regulations and research into what is or is not impactful to our environment, our livestock, and the rest of it, is being told largely en masse to move to Kansas or get fired in two weeks. So we have like the very interesting dismantling of the protections of food that we eat, which brings me back to the story that I was bringing up before. You have scientists making your food in a lab under a separate <laughs> condition where they, uh, hundred percent pure, <laughs> where they, where, where, yeah, where it is a highly controlled environment. Uh, you yeah, want sure. a, you want a regulatory organism like the FDA yes. to be doing its job. Yes, and and if they only have to look at a giant bioreactor and not try to legislate from the office that hasn't been built yet that they're supposed to move to in Kansas yeah, uh, or get fired and just do away with the USDA, Uh, an FDA that doesn't seem to be being prompted to do, and they don't know why Uh, I'm I'm reading into it, but they can only see that the, the reports that the FDA puts out are down and when, uh, when asked, the, uh, there was a written statement from the FDA that did not dispute the findings of the report. So they're not making a counter argument. They're saying, yep, that's what's happening. Didn't elaborate, <laughs> didn't explain. Uh, this is why, that's why. Nope, just, yep. We're, we're not doing as much as we did. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, fingers crossed that. Policies, people. Yeah. Things will turn around. <laughs> exactly. Speaking of turning around, I think I know what time it is. Uh-oh. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you, what you got, Blair? I have two fun good news stories this week. So the first story I have is about white nose syndrome in bats. We've talked about it on the show several times, but it is a problem. This is not the good news part of the story. Uh, it's uh, coming. White nose syndrome has destroyed bat populations across eastern North America. It is showing no signs of stopping. Um, It spreads in the winter. It causes bats to leave their roosts during hibernation. It's a fungus we've discovered since I started reporting on it. And the fungus kills the bats over several months. It depletes their their bat fat stores. Say that five times fast. And when it depletes the fat stores, it forces them to expend more energy on finding food in the winter when they're normally sleeping. So that is what eventually 
kills the bats. They die of starvation or exposure to the cold. The Specifically, the little brown bat, northern long-eared bat, Indiana bat, and tricolored bat populations have declined by 70 to 99% across 44 states since 2006. So this fungus is wreaking havoc. A lot of these bats are now considered functionally extinct. They do not fulfill their role in the environment any longer. Um, so this is a big problem, but a new study from Virginia Tech and UC Santa Cruz was looking at the impact of probiotics on white nose. Um, they found that overall it did reduce the impact of the disease. So they did this in two stages, which I think is really interesting. Um, so the first thing they did is they actually had a um, natural kind of wild cohort that they treated. So this is an abandoned mine in Wisconsin. They tested the efficacy of a um, bacteria, Pseudomonas fluorescens, um, so P. fluorescens, in two simultaneous experiments. So in one of them, the, the bats were caged, so it was controlled. And in another, they were free flying. So they were all tagged with a passive integrated transponder, P PIT, a pit tag, um, which allowed researchers to identify and keep track of the individuals over the time. And they wanted to see what happened when the bats had freedom of movement, when they could go out into the natural field, and when they could interact with the environment like they would normally versus when they're held in a cage. What they saw was that treatment with this bacteria lengthened the amount of time that bats stayed in the mine when they had the option to leave. So this delayed emergence time, which ultimately is what they think is the, the final kicker in what kills bats from white nose syndrome. So the delayed emergence time puts the bats emerging closer to spring when there are more insects available, which gives them a greater chance of survival and recovery. In the caged experiment, there were individuals that got really sick and um, that influenced survival estimates, um, but they found that the amount of fat that the bat had was the only important factor in predicting their survival in the cage trial, not how infected they were. So if they were infected at all, it would appear that they were waking up, they were stirring, they were needing more nutrients, and so it depended how much fat they had on them. But the level of infection didn't seem to matter. Um, in the free-flying experiment, their controls only had 10% survivability, um, while their treatment group had 50% survivability. So they're considering this a five-fold increase in survivability, which is huge. They were thinking of ways that the probiotic treatment could be developed for um, the wild, for a more increased application or trial. Um, so currently researchers are testing to see if pairing probiotics with other treatments, uh, some of which we've talked about on the show, can increase survival even more. Um, since a lot of you are probably wondering, I had to do a pretty deep dive into the paper to figure out exactly how they were treating the bats with probiotics. No, they're not giving them yogurt. Uh, they actually do a spray a liquid spray onto their wings to apply the probiotic, mm. which is interesting because their control, they don't spray at all because their control as they saw it was um, treatment versus no treatment, not type of treatment. Right. So in this particular study, they didn't get a wet spray at all if they were a control. And so. Um, that okay. So the ones in the cages didn't get the spray. So the bats in cages and the bats free flying both got both treatment sets. Okay. But so they wanted to see kind of what ultimately was killing the bats. And it appeared okay. that when they were free flying, it was the act of going outside, searching for food, exhausting themselves, getting cold. Which would then stress their systems potentially. Mm -hmm. And also because they're flying and if they don't catch food, then they're depleting their fat stores. And exactly. so they're less able to protect themselves immunologically. Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. you go. So huh. um, interesting stuff. Probiotics, so, not just so, for us. Yeah. So we should just go spray caves with <laughs> bacteria. <laughs> I mean, we could. Yeah. That would be... That would be yeah, go out there with one of those uh, sprayers that you used to spray fertilizer on your lawn. <laughs> just just spray all the bats. 
and be on your way. It could actually work, and that could be a thing that happens. So that, stay tuned. Lick their that. wings. Yeah. Um, next, let's move on to the other uh, good news story that I have here. Um, a turtle may save your life. What? It may save again? your life when again? you are again, when you are suffering from heart attack. Let me explain. <laughs> yeah, please. What? This does not make any sense. This yeah. is a study from University of Manchester and University of North Texas. And this is looking at snapping turtles and specifically why they can survive up to six months without oxygen. So in the wild, these guys will be under uh, frozen ice. That sometimes they'll be underwater. They'll they'll find all these uh, situations where these turtles will be uh, without access to air for up to six months. Um, and so, how are these turtles making it through? They're um, really good at holding their breath. Yeah, basically. So. Yes, but why is the question. Um, mm -hmm. So this study looked at the embryonic living heart and how it can be programmed to survive low oxygen environments as adults. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is looking specifically at juvenile common snapping turtles and how biological mechanisms early in life help them survive later on in low oxygen environments so low oxygen during embryonic development specifically way 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 early during embryonic development being in low oxygen programs the animal's hearts to be resilient to hypoxia and that resilience lasts for the rest of their lives so hypoxia is also what happens to a human during heart attack or and it can also damage a heart during transplant surgery. Mm -hmm. So knowing how to, ha to use this on humans could have a huge impact on, um, on the quality of life and even staying alive for a lot of humans. So um, hypo hypoxia during development in these turtles actually causes epigenetic changes to the genome. It turns genes on or off that are key to the ability of the turtle to tolerate zero oxygen. So is it zero oxygen? Are they able to just do really some low. Sort of skin absorption? It's, it's really low. The skin absorption isn't really part of it because when you think about um when you think about uh, you're right. That's a little bit of something, but ultimately it's not enough. It's not enough to completely supplement. But it's a thing turtles can do, which is like uh, most non. But it's not, it's not that. equivalent that, that to like, are an amphibious, yeah, no, I think that, I think that's an important note. We know that um, turtles can absorb oxygen through the skin in their anus, um, but they, it's not like having gills. No, no, yeah. it's certainly not. And it's not like having amphibian skin where your entire body is performing right. that. So it's not enough to supplement a fully developed heart and circulatory system just with that. So when we've heard of it, it's like when river turtles will go dive for like, you know, an hour. But mm -hmm. this is six months. This is six months. This is so this is this is a, a totally different level. Um, so this is uh, looking at the specific epigenetic signatures that help turtles survive in low oxygen environments. Um, they isolated heart muscle cells from juvenile turtles, which lived as embryos in either normal levels of oxygen, which is 21%, or half levels of oxygen, which is 10%. This mimics what happens in nature. So eggs at the bottom of the turtle's nests are more exposed to hypoxia. So some turtles are more used to it than others was what happens. As they subjected the juvenile turtles to lower levels of oxygen, they measured intracellular calcium, which binds the, uh, the, the proteins in the heart, um, in the myofilaments, the pH and the reactive oxygen species. So this is a um, reactive oxygen species are molecules which can become toxic when tissue reoxygenates 
too quickly. So basically, they just monitored all the stuff going on um, inside of their heart. And they showed that early exposure to hypoxia, hypoxia in these animals reduces the amount of reactive oxygen species that could protect them from damage and allows them to contract uh, contract normally, the heart to contract normally, in the complete absence of oxygen. So if we had a drug that was able to switch yep. on mechanisms to protect the human heart from oxygen deprivation, that could be huge to humans, right. especially Americans. <laughs> That's the number one right cause of death in America is some sort of heart disease. So that would be a pretty significant breakthrough if these turtles could tell us how to even temporarily help with a hypoxic environment in your heart. Yeah. That would be amazing. Oh, yep, turtles. Yep. I love this research for two different levels though, where it's it this is just telling us about this really interesting aspect of turtle physio physiological development. Right? We're just learning about this is this interesting thing that happens in turtles. Yeah. But we could learn from it and potentially if we can turn these things on in our own bodies, it could have similar effects. Yeah. Maybe we can learn from the turtles. Maybe there's something yes. from years back. Oh, but you know what? Researchers right now, they're also trying to learn from mold in space. Did we bring it there? I feel like we brought it there, right? Yeah. <laughs> and apparently it's a... Apparently, it is a pretty big problem that uh, mold grows a lot on the International Space Station. And did Karen leave her sandwich out again? <laughs> Karen, <laughs> no, I think Karen may have. Uh, yeah, so uh, there apparently there are areas where moisture builds up because you know they have it's all a closed system if there is any moisture it's going to stay there on the inside not going into the electronics hopefully right and mold gets into surfaces and can potentially uh, just start growing and so mold is a big problem on the inside of the space station it grows on everything and so researchers decided they wanted to look at some of these species of mold that have grown very well on the space station. And they took a common black mold called Aspergillus niger, grows on the space station very well. And so, of course, <laughs> they decided let's, let's expose it to radiation. And we want to see how much radiation these things can take. Is mold in space, like, could it have gone between or could it travel to Mars with us? Could we take Mars, mold to Mars? So, quote unquote, researchers fired stupid amounts of radiation Wait, is at that... this mold. So, <laughs> what? Stupid amounts? With this I'm, sure, I'm sure it was from an interview, but sure. yes, <laughs> this isn't a technical term, but it's stupid amounts. So, um, a there's the, the terminology for the measurement of the amount of absorbed radiative energy is called a gray. People get radiation sickness at 0.5 gray. They get killed when they are exposed to 5 gray. These spores of Aspergillus niger survived 500 to 1,000 gray. That's a lot. Depending on the type of radiation they were exposed to. They were exposed to a bunch of different kinds of radiation, but they were, they survived a whole bunch. They survived large amounts of high energy ultraviolet radiation, which really? is what is used as hospital disinfectant. Uh, uh -oh. And that is used or has been proposed to be used to sterilize the surface of spacecraft so hold on well. what if mold isn't from earth 
<laughs> mold is from Earth. I mean, it is biologically, genetically, it, it is part of the DNA family tree that we've got going on that goes. But that. maybe that's the panspermia was maybe mold. Panspermia. Maybe it mold. Can, if it can survive that, then, it, you know, it could could hitch a ride on something and end up here. Yeah. Um there are, are there are studies now, that, that suggest so now I'm never going to to to, follow, to be work in a hood uh <laughs> biological oh. cabinet that has been used by anybody mm. in the fungal group. Oh no. Uh, Cuz obviously even leaving the UV light on overnight is not going to do it. Yeah. Not going to do it. No. Uh, the researcher who did this work, Marta Cortesau, a microbiologist at the German Aerospace Center in Cologne, and her, her uh, she was quoted as saying, we will have spores with us for sure in our space travels. Fungi have been forgotten for the past 20 or 30 years, but it is time to go back to them. Yes, we need to find out. Uh, yeah, so these... Uh, there is an older study that says that suggests that mold spores might resist radiation even better in a vacuum. So, hey, not just on the inside of the yeah. spacecraft, but on the outside. On the outside. Yeah, that's that's outside. what I was thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, we really need to take a look at the stuff that we may be taking with us. And my last story quickly for the night is if you're going to exercise, hey, know that you really are doing something good for your brain. Researchers from Oregon Health Sciences University discovered a gene in mice that gets turned on with exercise and not with like marathon running type exercise, but in what they call a short bout of exercise, something equivalent to about 4,000 steps or a pretty vigorous game of basketball, one-on-one -on -one mm. basketball or something. Um, this gene that got turned on is called MTSS1L. It had previously not stood out in studies in the brain. These researchers, they're like, hey, exercise studies, they look at the body all the time. We want to know what's happening here in the brain. MTSS1L encodes a protein that leads to the development of dendritic spines on neurons in an area of the brain called the hippocampus. Hmm. So what they think, okay, dendritic spines are the places where synapses form. Good stuff. So if you have more synapses, you have more connectivity. So the location of the brain is indicative of what that activity might be related to. The hippocampus is involved in learning and memory. And so a short burst of exercise might be enough to prime your brain to learn and How remember short? How short? better. Like 4,000 steps, man. Uh, 4,000? <laughs> Come on. Can we cut it down a little bit? Can I you do that with, in three minutes? Not three minutes. No, not three minutes. But we're talking like maybe you could do this in like 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Okay, 4,000. That's a long. Vigorous, 20, vigorous 15 to 20 minutes of exercise. That's great. Could Quarter be. Mile turning on your hippocampus, getting those neurons in there, ready for more activity, learning, and memory. That's great. You know, I I do workouts uh, many mornings, and it's usually about 25 minutes. And uh, lately, I've noticed sometimes I wake up with a headache, and my headache will sometimes go away, which I realize is not related to this really at all. But I just recognize that it's part of my brain, right? So it's just about circulation. It's about, you know, movement. It's about all that kind of stuff. But it's a good reminder that your brain is part of your whole body. And your brain needs health just like the rest of your body. But what you do with your body can benefit your brain. Yeah. There you yeah. Go. Anyone got one quick story? Yeah. Um, do you know that crocodiles were once vegetarians? No. What? Yes. You'd have to go way back about 200 million years. But it turns out new fossils looking at around 146 teeth from 16 crocodiliforms um, looked at by University of Utah identifies, yes, these were not just carnivore teeth. These appear to be teeth that ate vegetables. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So um, they were non-carnivorous 
And um, it looks like. And now they, they eat babies. And now, sh- sure. Um, but yeah, not only that they ate plants occasionally, but they were actually herbivorous crocodiliforms. So not just eating both, but j- eating just plants. So this means there are there were lots of different types of crocodilians that were around, and um, the meat eaters won out, but they weren't always that way. And a team led by Anubav Jain, Sciences Berkeley Lab in, uh, Labs Energy Storage and Distributed Resources Division, has collected 3.3 million abstracts of published mili- uh, m- materials on science papers that have been then fed to an algorithm called word to vec This is taking basically 100 years. It went back to 1912 up to the current day. Uh, in a field where a dozen papers or more are filed each week in material sciences and fed them to this thing and had it just read it and see what it could do without specific instructions, uh, uh, without telling it anything about material science. It learned concepts like the periodic table, the crystal structure of metals, said Jane, that hinted at the potential of the technique, but probably the most interesting thing we figured out is you can use this algorithm to address gaps in materials research, things that people should have studied at some point, but haven't gotten around to. Uh, The paper establishes that the text mining of scientific literature can uncover hidden knowledge and that pure text-based extraction can establish basic scientific knowledge, says Cedar, one of the people that helped on this study. Um, Yes, if you read your textbooks, you could learn something. Shouldn't be surprising. Interesting that this robot was able to. They So they put in 3.3 million abstracts. This uh, machine learning read uh, all of this. Between, it was between uh, 1922 and 2018. It came up with, not only like could it go back and say, pretty good degree of certainty, picked 10 materials that it thought would be good thermoelectric uh, conveyors. And it came up with these 10, some of which we're already working on, some of which we haven't looked at because they're very rare, or very toxic, and you we maybe haven't considered. So it made some predictions. They said, okay, that's that's close. But then they did something which I find very interesting. They cut off uh, the text that they fed it to the year 2000 to see if it could predict what we discovered since 2000 in the last uh, 18 19 years top predictions uh turned up uh uh, that turned out to be things that were showing up in later studies four times more than if the materials had just been chosen at random for example three of the top five predictions trained using the data uh up to the year 2008 have since been discovered and the remaining two are uh are things that are are rare talk so which with the, what this what this makes me think is, you know, this is great for future, you know, yes. coming up with ideas for future studies, because basically people read literature yes. and they come up with ideas for studies because of what they learn. And so that's what this computer algorithm did is it read a bunch of studies mm-hmm. and said, these are possible things. So, so mm-hmm. it did a little bit more. It read all of the studies, of the, which no human studies. has yeah. done. No. Uh, and by it was, but it was kind of, it's like it was able to uh, extract relationships between frequency of words, how closely they were associated with each other, and created, uh, they're calling it a 200 dimensional abstract uh, vector of how this information related to its uh, other bits of information. Yeah. And it constructed it to the point where it could predict materials that hadn't been discovered up to the point of that. Uh, of that level of research, which which I'm glad they did the backwards one because then it can give them confidence in using it this going forward. But this was not a a, a learning system for new materials uh, specifically. That's just what they fed it, yeah. which means you could feed this thing uh, potentially any large data set of of science discipline, of papers within a as narrow a gap as, you know, can produce millions of papers having been written on. And it could make predictions 
and it might be able to like give you fill in gaps that nobody has studied yet. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. That is a an active machine learning that looks like it has some really great potential. That's great to hear you say because you're you're very skeptical of the machine learning. No, no, I'm not skeptical of machine learning. I'm skeptical of the the deep learning thing. Yeah, okay. One, the one where you have to give it all of the things <laughs> in advance. What's What's uh, really fascinating about this system that they created is they didn't teach it how to read, and it came up with learning. It put the things together itself. That's the thing. That's the version of this, you know, of, of big uh, data uh, machine learning that's that has that exciting feel to it. Is the thing where you didn't tell it what to do, and it figures it out. Then when you tell it everything to do, it's going to be limited by the input. Yeah, so. there was another one this last last week. Uh, researchers did uh, they created a system to simulate the universe to try and oh, yeah, figure yeah. out the structures in the universe. And they're trying to improve upon past computer models for simulating the universe. But in this particular situation, it modeled the universe. It's much better than the last models that have been done. And it Fantastic. predicted things like dark matter. And they don't understand how the program came up with it or is coming up with the things that it's coming up with. So, so there's there's this interesting feedback where the computer is coming up with stuff that they didn't really expect it to. And they have yeah. to go back and figure it out. Yeah. So this is a quote from Jane, actually. This is, this is which is, this is echoing what you just said. I honestly didn't expect the algorithm to be so predictive of future results. I had thought maybe the algorithm could be descriptive of what people had done before, but not come up with these different connections. I was pretty surprised when I saw not only the predictions, but also the reasoning behind the predictions. Uh, things like it, you, it threw out the half uh, Hussler structure, which is a really hot crystal structure for thermoelectrics these days. So he's even pointing out, like, I did not... Like, this was not the <laughs> scope of what we were doing. This thing exceeded uh, what they thought their project yeah. was. Yep. Woo. It's exciting. Yeah. Does that do it? That did it. All right, everyone. We have come to the end of our show. It's a good long one, but so full of good information. So much good stuff this week. Thank you, co-hosts, for an amazing show. Thanks for doing this with me. Thank you to Fada for helping in the chat room, monitoring things over on our YouTube chat. Thank you for helping with the social media and those show notes. Thank you to Identity4 for recording the show. Thanks, Gord, for being our chat room guy over at the Twist chat room. And a big thank you to our Patreon sponsors. I want to thank Paul Disney, Richard Onimus, Ed Dyer, Ed, Andy Gross, Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Craig Landon, Mark Mazaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K, Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Jean Tellier, John Gridley, David Williams, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stefan Alberon, John Atwis Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedall, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Ben Bignell, Richard Porter, Noodles, Kevin Rinnerton, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, at RDM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, John Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Drapo, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessen, Flo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us there, you can find information at twist.org. There is a link or you can go directly to patreon.com slash this week in science. And remember, you can also help us out simply by telling your friends about Twist. On next week's show, we will be joined by science rapper Baba Brinkman. He's going to give us some freestyle science raps to go along with our science news. Nice. So I hope you are ready for that good time. And once again, we're going to be on here at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday night, twist.org slash live. You can watch, join our chat room. If you can't make it, you, there's also our YouTube channel, This Week in Science on YouTube, where you can also join the chat room there. Both 
things. It all gets archived. We have these things. It's the internet and we save them there. So you can find past episodes at our YouTube channel or just twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory or anywhere in This Week in Science in the Apple Marketplace. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. While you're there, you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. Yes, or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistManion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, what happens, Blair? You'll be spam filtered into a Blair. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science... This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. is coming your way so everybody listen to what i say i use the scientific method for all that it's worth and i'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 this week in science this week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we said then please just remember it's all in your head cause it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science, science, science. this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science, science, science. this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.